The ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict creates a unique set of challenges for the mental health needs of Arab and Palestinian Americans. And what are the necessary frameworks we must understand in an effort to empower Palestinian clients? And do we look to others, ourselves, or in the community with social justice and activism efforts? And in what way might a decolonial and generational trauma-informed approach enable us to examine the power of collective healing. Welcome to People of Color and Psychology, the show that explores mental health topics specific to culture, diversity, and communities of color. I am your host, Jack Sun. As part of our Arab American Heritage Series, our guest today is Dr. Shireen Sarka Letterman, an international counseling psychologist that specializes in trauma services and community psychology. Currently, most of Dr. Shireen's time is spent providing consultation to international community on culturally responsive care, particularly for Palestinians and those who have been displaced. Prior to her consulting in private practice, Dr. Shireen worked as a program coordinator at an adolescent substance abuse program, creating treatment curriculums for group and family therapies and coordinated psychiatric and substance abuse care for adolescents and families. Now, as part of her doctoral training, Dr. Shireen began working in trauma services with refugee groups and developed a children's story designed to address the anxieties of refugee children. Dr. Shireen also completed clinical experiences in Ghana and Rwanda. And finally, for her PhD, Dr. Shireen published her dissertation titled Descendants of Palestine. Exploring the Right of Return in Diaspora. In connecting all her experiences, her love for writing and storytelling, Dr. Shireen also published a set of children's books that promote positive social skills titled The Trotters of Tweeville, and has written about her experiences as a third culture kid on several online platforms and a psychology contributor to Care.com and Jezebel. As a Palestinian-American psychologist, Dr. Shireen will be discussing the Palestinian experience and the important socio-cultural political considerations for engaging in culturally responsive care. Dr. Shireen, thank you so much for being a part of our series and thank you for speaking with me today. Well, thank you for having me. You know, why don't you start off with just sharing with me some of the work that you're currently doing. Why don't you share with me what's going on? My specialty is the Palestinians in the diaspora, mainly the United States, because obviously that's where I'm based and that's where I grew up. So I am Palestinian, and I think that that's always driven my work. My father was a Nakba survivor, and I always, I always feel like people already know the story because I've heard it so many times, but I guess I should kind of explain a little bit about what that is. Back in 1948, in the midst of creating the state of Israel, the Nekba, what is called, what is referred to in Arabic as the Nekba, which is called catastrophe, occurred. And basically what happened was 750,000 Palestinians were displaced to create the state of Israel. And in the midst of that displacement, obviously there was a lot of war crimes, rapes, murders, killings. And again, you know, this whole population that was now displaced. And that kind of sparked, you know, like I know we talk about when we talk about genocide, we talk about it as if it were began six months ago, you know, for Palestinians, from our perspective, that's kind of where it started for us. So this has just been as the years have gone by, it's become more and more systemic. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing now that brings it to the level of genocide that everybody else can understand where what you're seeing is, again, it's very systemic. It's very intentional. The leaders are very intentional. The level of killing is very intentional. The level of torture is very intentional. So because all of that is very intentional, I think it's very clear to people now. And I I mean, I also have to say, I think with the advent of, you know, it's been 76 years for us, right? With the advent of social media, I think that has brought a lot of this to the forefront. Thank you for explaining this, because I remember just for myself trying to learn about what is going on. I I read about the Nakba and happening in 1948, but I didn't know that at that time, that was already the beginning of the systematic process of genocide. And uh, I think one of the things that through our conversation, 
you mentioned that it's helpful for us to also understand that terminology as we're working with potentially Palestinian clients. Uh, so why don't you just share with me some thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to recognize that this is a genocide. This is the intent here is to eradicate a culture, to eradicate ethnicity. And like I said, for us, the campaign has begun way before six months ago. It, and it started very much, it, it started, I mean, of course, depending upon who you talk to, but I think the big com, big community rupture, right, was the, the Nakba of 1948. We can see that the idea of creating this Zionist state in Palestine was very much on the mind of Europe, you know, and that was, and that's where you kind of begin to see that it, this was a system uh, that was a, this was a system that was a colonial project. And so that's why it does look so systemic. Like, so for example, part of that system is developing propaganda to ensure that the public is supportive of what's happening and contribute to that trope of the Arab terrorist that has kind of been circulating, you know, probably in American history for quite a while, but mostly in modern history, I guess, for the last 30 years, mainly since 9-11. Thanks for bringing in, you know, this identity piece how that the propaganda, but I think is now lumping into the Arab identity. Part of our goal here is to also understand the diaspora of Arab and Arab, um, how should I say, what's the proper term here? Arab ethnicity or Arab I, I mean, for, I, I, I guess that's, you know, that's one of the questions, I guess, right? I refer to myself as a Palestinian American. I was born and raised here, but my ethnicity is Palestinian. And that is very much, you know, like I think for Palestinians, we've never, it's always been about going back. And so that's kind of where my dissertation came in. It was always, we went to bed at night, you know, our bedtime stories were about what Palestine used to be and, and how we're gonna go back and what it was like. And, and so I think for us, it's always like you have one foot in this country and one foot in that one. So I think that's kind of part of the, the challenge of being Palestinian American. And the idea of uh, the Arab identity, I think, is a little unique for Palestinians because, you know, our oppressors like to call us Arabs so that they can deny our Palestinian identity. So when people call us Arabs, it kind of feels like we're being lumped into this group of, of people with this ethnicity that's, you know, it's like supposed to be this just general idea of what a person is supposed to be in that region. I mean, and again, and that stuff's very purposeful, you know what I mean? There's a reason why there's an attempt to to get rid of this Palestinian identity and kind of get Palestinians to, to be absorbed in these other Arab uh, countries. Yeah. And, and that region has such a diverse group of people. It's amazing yeah. that it's all lumped into just Arab, <laughs> frankly, to be honest. It's yes. Confusing. I mean, that's just it. I think it's very offensive to all 22 Arab nations to consider us just Arab. You know, there are some dialects I don't even understand. So I think this, I, I mean, I, I understand it, right? I understand where the notion of being an Arab comes from and, and this whole idea of Arab identity and uh, Arab American identity and Arab American heritage. You know, I also think that there is a level of, you, you just miss something by by just lumping us all into this group of Arabs instead of just looking at our individual identities. They each come with their own different recipes and their own different dialects and their own, you know, their own different cultures. And they're, I think it's a, a disservice to them. And it sounds like as we're having this conversation, particularly when therapists are working with, I'll just put quote, air quote, you know, Arab uh, clients, and on the intake form, you know, they are even more specific, you know, say I'm from Palestine. And so it would probably be a good idea for therapists to understand, oh, wait, let's address them by how they want to be identified, Palestinian identity. Right. Um, now, because of the genocide that's happening right now and the need for a lot of support services, you've been contacted for a lot of consultation work. And I think you've also talked about the long-term plan of what support looks like. Okay. Well, one of the things that actually it's something that me and my niece have started part of the diaspora psychologist is to create this network of Palestinian psychologists that can be of service to Palestinians coming out of Gaza as this is all happening. 
And so the hope is that we can get it going. It can be something internationally, right? But at the same time, it's, and the, the, the purpose really was to kind of keep everything in the community and allow Palestinians, you know, I think one of the, the, the hardest things about being Palestinian is displacement, right? We're dispersed. And so part of this initiative was a way to kind of bridge the gap and get people from there to, to talk to people here. You know what I mean? And kind of uh, create that level of community, because I really believe that that's kind of how we heal. Diasporic mobilization is really big, you know what I mean? That's that's also part of how we heal. And if we look at Palestinian history, that everything is about a community, right? The community heals together. So this was kind of a way to, to honor that and and just continue the work of, of really like educating Palestinians even on what has happened to them as a result of everything that's, as a result of all the, the violence that they've witnessed and experienced. Yeah, and so trying to keep it connected with the community, within the community. Right. I would also imagine that that puts a lot of demand on you and other Palestinian psychologists. I mean, it, the other thing is that, you know, we're at the same time witnessing, you know, we're, we're, in, we're in this diaspora witnessing what's happening at the same time. So, I mean, again, the nice part is, is that it does create a, a collective a, a network of all of us to be able to kind of share with each other and kind of heal with each other at the same time. And may I ask, what is the role of the organization? Our role is really to connect them to counselors, to hopefully on the, on the ground, right? If not, then through telehealth. And the really the hope it, through the initiative, what we were hoping to do is get people through one year of therapy. Um, and obviously we didn't want to put the financial burden on the therapist of having to do that on their own and using and expending their time. So we wanted to compensate them as well. For therapists like myself and others who are trying to be more culturally aware and competent, what are some important considerations for us to take into therapy if we truly practice this idea of providing culturally responsive care for Arab Americans or Palestinian Americans? I mean, I think it's very important for a therapist or a counselor in the United States when dealing with Palestinians to come from a decolonial perspective. So I think that's first and foremost. It's important to know what settler colonialism is. It's important to know how that's impacted the population. And then, of course, how that's impacted your client, right? Um, and then from there, I think what I like to do is really bring people back to their community, encourage people to find cultural events and things that are related to Palestine in the diaspora. That's one of the things that I kind of encourage people to do. So I encourage people to do things like go to protests. I encourage people to go to all the cultural events, right? Go to the teachings, even if I know we all know the history, you know what I mean? But But go anyway, just to be in community. And I think it's really important for you know, allies to also be in that community with us. Do you know what I'm saying? And and yes, we're not, you know, there's only so many Palestinian therapists, right? Obviously we need help from other people as well. And yes, it, we have, and I think one of the big things that I focus on also is the generational piece, right? The generational trauma. You know, a lot of people have been saying, oh, this is the first live stream genocide, right? It's, it's again, for us, if you look at, this has been going on for 76 years. I remember being 11 and, and watching the first Intifada on television. So this is, you know, I mean, it's not the first time we've seen these images. It's not the first time that, and it's certainly, you know, I hate to just kind of keep putting it on Palestine because it's, unfortunately, it's not the only genocide right now either. And so just, you know, as an international psychologist, I think it's important to point out that, you know, you do have the Congo, Sudan, you know, all these other places that are also suffering and also need attention. It's like part of the healing process is even though we may know the story, the client, it's important for the clients to connect with others in community. And that is a huge part of the healing process rather than the zero centric perspective of a one-on-one -on -one therapy, one-on-one -on -one relationship. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And to also understand the colonial perspective of how that may impact their identity as well as their suffering that they're coming into treatment for. Also as therapists, for us to be allies, and what does that mean to be an ally? You're saying show up to some of these protests. Hmm. And, and of course, yeah, and it means writing your congressman and it means right, you know, reaching out to your senators, like all of those things, you know, showing up at protests, all of those things, all of those things matter. Right? It really matters to see people and, and to have allyship in all of those arenas. 
because it is a collective effort. You know what I mean? It's not going to be one thing that gets us all to liberation. It is going to be everybody's effort. It's interesting. It, it as you're talking about this, I'm reflecting on this idea that, you know, it just kind of like the Black Lives Matter movement, where if the Black Lives do not matter, then no one is free. So it's like this idea that if right. we do not pursue this idea of uh, making everyone free, you know, we don't make the Palestinians free from basically the oppression that they are in, then no one is free because that can easily creep up to someone else. Right. Hmm. So can you share with me any memorable events or circumstances that led to you to pursue this type of work in psychology? I don't even know how I got into psychology, to be honest. <laughs> I think I just kind of... <laughs> it was probably like in the background of my life, uh, my entire life, until I kind of had words for it. But I think really what I have a master's degree in, in communication and information studies, and I was fascinated by interpersonal communication and how, and how health played a part into interpersonal communication. And that just kind of, that just kind of spiraled into wanting to know more really about relationship. And the best way for me to do that was psychology. So that's kind of how I ended up in psychology. But I think, you know, also growing up Palestinian, I think there's always that, again, that identity piece, right? Where there's always this uh, culture conflict of, of trying to be, trying to fit in and trying to maintain your identity all at the same time. And of course, just growing up children of immigrants, you know what I mean? That's not easy for anybody either. But I think here in the United States, I think Palestinians in the United States have a special relationship with the United States, right? Like we, we have this love-hate relationship with the United States because it's really, you know, it's not, Americans are wonderful, right? Like we're all generally pretty good people, but then we have government policies that, you know, that are, are perpetrating a genocide on our people. And so how, you know, and, and, and of course, like for Palestinians, these are not just, it's not foreign to us, right? These are our family. These are our friends. These are actual people that we know that we've interacted with you know these are places that we've been right that we're watching be demolished it's you know and of course at the same time we all know that our tax dollars are going to fund this right so they say so, you know as a client that we all come in with like you know the guilt the shame the the survival guilt that we all have and again like i think that's just kind of like carried through right like i don't think that's something i think that's just something that we all kind of carry with us those of us that live here also, like the stuff that's kind of led me to psychology and, and exploring things like generational trauma. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. It dawned on me the other day. All these stories, right, that we heard about the Nekba, are, we're actually witnessing. It's no longer like this social memory that we had, right? It's no longer that generational trauma. It's actual trauma, right? We're witnessing it now. You're no longer dreaming this up. It's real. Right. It's not just your community that is witnessing it. Others are seeing it, the reality. Right. Yeah. So I am wondering, what were some of the challenges you faced in your career as a person of color that you would be willing to share and that you overcame that you would be willing to share? I don't know that there's one incident. I think that um, it's just a challenge. You know what I mean? I, you know, I always say, you know, it doesn't matter what you think I am until I open my mouth and I tell you my name is Shireen and you know, I'm not from here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so all of a sudden we've set up what's about to come next. And that's kind of just, and that's always, and you know, of course that becomes the expectation and that becomes the norm. And it's just, there's this expectation, right? That it's not going to be easy for you. And I think that was just kind of built in to my life. Like my parents were very, I think, very realistic with us. You know what I mean? That this was going to be something that you were going to have to consider at some point. You know what I mean? It is going to be a part of your life, right? Your, whether it was your Arab identity or your Palestinian identity. And it was very clear, like even growing up, that that was an issue, right? That, um, I mean, even things like, uh, I remember we had to do a world cultures project. My parents, my parents were like, don't do Palestine. They didn't want the, the controversy. So my, my father was uh, exiled to Jordan. He was like, you know, I, I lived in Jordan most of my life, just Jews, Jordan. My mother's family was exiled to Syria. So my mother said, I, you know, I lived in Syria my whole life, just do Syria, that kind of thing, you know. And it's interesting, like, and then, of course, you know, it comes back full circle. I've got my kid, right, who's now doing her world, proje world cultures project. 
And she's, of course, you know, my kids are very vocal. They're very, you know, they have no shame about being Palestinian. And so, but at the same time, right, she's handing in her project and I want to die inside, right? Thinking, oh my God, you know, how, what is it going to look like to her teacher? What is it going to look like to her classmates? Is there somebody in her classmate, in her class, that's going to say something like, you know, Palestinians don't exist because that does happen. Oh, yeah. Gosh. So it's more of like those little challenges. It's not so much my career that that I think is challenging. It's just being Palestinian, I think, is challenging, right, in the United States in this moment. Wow. Wow. And so being Palestinian. And I don't think it's just me oh. either. Like, I, I, you know what I mean? I want to say that. Like, I think most of us are. And at the same time, you know, I also want to say that we're not a monolith. We're very different especially those of us in the diaspora. We have mixed identities. We are heterosexual, we're homosexual, we're trans, but there's a queer community. I mean, we're all in it. And so I don't think it's fair to just kind of assume that we're all one thing either. So, and we have to, and we're struggling with all of those identities, right? In this moment. So in this moment, as a Palestinian American psychologist, what does that mean for you? I mean, to me, I see it as an opportunity for us to kind of shine. This is a moment where, you know, the platform can be ours, right? Can finally tell our side of the story and and be able to bring all of our contributions to the forefront, you know, and be visible for the first time, maybe. Because I think that's also part of the problem, right? It's very easy to dehumanize people you don't see. So I think it's an opportunity for us to be visible, for us to kind of debunk all of the the myths and the propaganda that's been out there. You know, but at the same time, it's also, it's very scary for my clients. You know what I mean? There's, the, I used to say, before October 7th, right? I wore a kofia every day and nobody thought twice about it. You know, <laughs> after October 7th, I'm like, oh my God, I'm wearing a kofia, right? All of a sudden it becomes a problem. So yeah, and I, and like I said, I mean, I think all of us on some level are feeling that, right? And like, not to, I, I mean, I think, you know, again, there's 22 Arab countries, so I don't want to lump us all into one, but I do think that those of us who have some sort of Arab ethnicity are also experiencing a lot of, you know, it's triggering a lot for them too, you know what I mean? And I don't want to discount that. And even people with, you know, a Muslim identity, right? Because uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of ignorance in the United States and people don't know the difference. So we all tend to get lumped up into one, you know, so whether it's anti-Palestinian racism, whether it's Islamophobia, it all tends to to look the same kind of going back to what you were saying everything gets washed lumped yes yeah yeah well uh dr shireen how can we support you i mean really i i think like i said before showing up you know what i mean i think that to me is the most important thing i would love to and you know i mean show up for other professionals right i can't tell you how many uh professionals have been killed as a result of everything that's happening, you know, psychosocial professionals. Um, so I think it's really important for people from our discipline to show up and to push back, right? Like when organizations come out, who shall remain nameless, come out with statements that don't really say much of anything or seemingly support one side, maybe you should push back. Maybe you should ask questions, right? Yeah. Now, your project, the network, uh, yeah. is there a name for this project? the diaspora psychologist and i think the the network you mentioned there's also a, a gofundme page yes okay there's Great. a GoFundMe. We'll, sure. we'll link that to the show notes okay. so uh dr shireen any final thoughts that part of being i think a healthcare provider on any level is being out in the streets with people and advocating for ourselves obviously right you know I, I like to tell people i don't need you to care about palestine i need you to care about your own country right i need you to care about the united states and care about everybody getting health care and everybody getting a, a, a fair share in the United States. I think that would change things dramatically. That would shift a lot of dollars. Well, Dr. Shireen, thank you so much for your insight and your contributions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. A huge thank you to our listeners. If you enjoyed this episode, please share and subscribe to People of Color in Psychology. You can also support us by registering for continuing education courses or making a one-time donation on the Multicultural Counseling Institute's website. Their feedback is important to us, so feel free to send an email, a message on LinkedIn, or leave a voice message on our website. Until next time, this is your host, Jack Zenn.